Okay. So we we've just left um we've just left all or nothing behind and we're now on to Vera Drake. Uh which was a very successful film. It feels, and you've said actually nothing secret about this, but you wanted to make a film specifically on this topic. Why was that? Well, <clears throat> I actually sat on the idea for decades. Um, the truth is that, like perhaps one or two people here, I'm old enough to remember what it was like before the 1967 <clears throat> Abortion Act. Uh, when people had unwanted abortions, unwanted ch babies, um, and uh, resorted to the likes of Vera Drake. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, not only the likes of Vera Drake, but people um, who were a great deal more exploitative and cynical than ever she would be. Um, and I was, um, on several occasions around those issues. I was never responsible for an unwanted pregnancy myself, but I was, uh, um, I s was around it happening. Um, so that was it, really. I, I sat on it for a long time. And um, it just felt the time had come to do it when, it, when we did. Yeah, I'm, I was thinking about the previous British films that featured this in any any way. There's 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 a couple of quite famous ones. There's Denham Elliott being the abortionist in Alfie, and um, I, God, I can't even remember which film it is. It's Saturday night. Saturday, Saturday night. night. It's, is it? It's not Hilda Baker and Saturday night and Sunday morning, is it? Yeah. My God. Um, I think she did two abortions. Anyway, I mean, I suppose it's always a peripheral figure. What's completely different about Vera Drake is she's absolutely the centre of the film and she's also an idealist of, of some kind. She totally. Th she thinks she's doing... Um, and, 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 you know, obviously, once having decided to make the film, um, I did a huge amount of research. And, you know, there were... I, I mean, there were women... Uh, there were stories... Um, in abundance of women who, when they were taken off by the cops, when they were arrested, everyone came out on housing estates and cheered them because they were an essential part of, uh, you know, uh, of their lives. Um, and yes, I mean, of course, they were extremely unpleasant and exploitative people. I remember uh, such characters in real life experiences but you know the the Vera Drakes were there and she wouldn't you know as we get in the film you know she she won't accept that it's abortions she helps young girls and she doesn't take a penny that's and she doesn't take a penny and, uh, you know no uh, and she's very surprised to discover that her quasi Absolutely. agent yeah. is in fact raking it in Absolutely. Which is uh, which was a standard, you know. Yeah, another facet happened, of the yeah. uh, black market in abortions, I sure. suppose. Yeah, um, and of course it goes without saying. That, I mean, I, I went to um, just in, in passing. Uh, it's important, I think, that uh, I um, had a little retrospective of my films only two or three months ago at the Lincoln Center in New York, and I went, and um, I said I mentioned. This film, I said, this film ought to be played across the states in every cinema, given Roe versus Wade. And I mean, they brought the house down. People were, you know, and I wish it would be, actually. Yes, it's more urgent than ever, of course. And that's an, an unwon battle. Uh, or rather, it started up again. Uh, unusually for you, not uniquely, because you knew this much that it was a film about a, an abortionist. I suppose when the business of raising money started, you were able to say that, and I wondered whether there was any resistance or any anything. No, uh, well, I, we didn't say much. In fact, I don't think we really did. Um, it was part of a 
there was a so-called three-picture deal with Studio Canal in Paris, and we made All or Nothing, which, uh, rather interestingly, given the conversation we had an hour or so back, uh, they didn't much care for. Um, I think partly because it wasn't commercially very successful in France. Um, So they wanted to wriggle out of the of the three picture deal and we finally persuaded them that if they let us make the second film they could uh, wriggle out of the third film and the second film was Vera Drake so it wasn't really an issue basically Um, I think it's possible that one of the producers there I I did mention the possibility of this but it wasn't it wasn't really an issue you didn't have to flag it up in order to uh, get the money okayed or anything like that that's that's good um so you started in the in the usual way. Uh, yeah, I mean, just to, to to pick up on the thing about not not the thing about not knowing what it's about and things. It's a very complex thing. I mean, I, I I've often got there's all ideas. There are always ideas kicking around. But yes, this was. I, I mean, this has in common with um, secrets and lies. I mean, as I've said here previously in the context of secrets and lies, with that film because people close to me had adopted, uh, that's really set the ball rolling with that. And I've just explained w- w- why I, for years, sat on the notion of making this film. Um, in fact, it, 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 the reality is that um, we were very, st- we're always very strict on the development of these stories. Um, in the preparatory period, with the actors, I, the actors not knowing anything about what the film is, except what their characters would know, so that we could ex- we can explore the situation in a completely organic way through improvisation and so on. This film, we had a very very strict discipline on the go, because obviously I, I, I was inviting Imelda Staunton to play the character. And I th- realised I, I couldn't not tell her I was intending to make a film about an abortionist. So that's not on. So I said, this is what it's going to be. And she said, fine, it's fine. Uh, I'm up for it. And it's good. All the characters, all the actors playing the characters in the family had no idea what it was about. Uh, and I'll come back to that shortly. But the likes of the judge and the police and the various I mean we told them in advance that this so that they could all be doing their research into the various things while we were developing the central characters and things so um, it, it, it was important that the actors playing the characters in the family only knew what they would know because obviously a great deal of effort went into the research of period and all that stuff um, uh, uh, um, when it came to creating, investigating and creating a big core part of the narrative, we, we actually did all the rehearsals, the development stuff, in a disused hospital up uh, next to the swimming, if anyone knows the area, next to the uh, Crouch End, next to the swimming baths, on the way to Alexandra Palace, there was what was a hospital that was going to be demolished, and is now there's now an NHS facility on that site. But this was an old hospital with all sorts of rooms and wards, and and we spent months um, using the an apartment that had been used by doctors and nurses on night shoots. Um, a night, sorry, night. That's a Freudian slip by a film. <laughs> uh, n- night shifts, sorry. Um, uh, that had become the um, Drake family apartment, and you know w- we spent a long time exploring the characters in, in the family, and the brother and the sister-in-law, and their relationships, and all the rest of it. And the visits from the woman who, in fact, we knew was actually doing the thing, uh, organising the abortions, fixing them. Um, 
And then one day on a Sunday, during about two and a half months before film, we filmed the scene in the film where the police come round and interrupt the party, we had an improvisation. We set up an improvisation that lasted 11 hours, which I referred to before. In which everybody, which means everybody staying in character in costume for 11 hours, really, in real time, and just doing whatever they do organically and spontaneously, without trying to make things happen or any of the world. And this was about the, when the police come round and all of that. What the actors in the family, they had no idea what, they did not know, as the fact the characters don't know, that she is practicing abortions. They had no idea about it. She didn't know that, and, and obviously during the preparatory period, um, there had been sessions, improvisations with Imelda playing Vera Drake, with the various women who, who needed help, as she would put it. Um, what she didn't know is that we'd explored the fact that the last one had gone wrong and that there were other actors playing doctor and nurses. and Nobody knew that there was a whole bunch of actors playing police. They, family actors didn't know that we'd set up a police station, complete with fingerprinting facilities, down the other end of the hospital in one of the wards. Um, and they were having this celebration. And it, it, it was dynamite. And, and all of a sudden, the cops showed up. And they, I, I remember one of the actors saying afterwards, couldn't think who that could be because there aren't any. There is nobody else. You know? uh, and of course, the, so I mean that gave us. I mean this wasn't wasn't uh, exactly what happened in the film. It gave us the basis for the experience, which then, two and a half months later, in the location in the flat in Bethnal Green, we were able to draw on that experience and construct the scene in in, in the film. So, to go back to what you said, I mean, of course, for some of the people involved in making it, they knew that this is what we were dealing with. I mean, like Jim Broadbent uh, uh, and the guys playing, the other guys playing lawyers, I mean, knew that they were going to be dealing with this issue. Uh, likewise, the cops. But uh, it was all about making it, you know, it's, which it always is, about, you know, bringing it to life and making it real. And, you know, y you have to have um, the texture and depth of what I suppose you might call subplots or other aspects of their lives, you know, to make it all make sense. But again, and this is um, a, a, something you can really see from Naked onwards, the integration of the various strands are, are very... It's very tightly woven in this film in particular, which has a much more... It, the character of Vera Drake has a big secret in a way that no other character of yours has. I mean... Well, it's in the nature of the... I mean, in a way, uh, yeah. it's, it's it, 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 debatable because actually... Um, I, don't, I, 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 I don't want to dwell on this too much because we would have to go into a lot of... Um, Sideways. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, in a way, the, the way that we hopefully create these characters, like real people in real life, is that everybody's full of secrets. I and mean, everybody in this room yes. is a walking um, a feast of secrets of one kind or another. We'll be getting to those later. Yeah, you can, you know, we'll have a confessional session. Yeah. Right? Um, so in a way, I think that's important, you know. That, that, you know. Yes. I, I, but I, I, of course, this happens to be a film about a particular kind of a... Yes, and I, I suppose the fact that we all have secrets uh, is, is one thing. But it, it, I'm thinking about questions of dramaturgy and about how you put a, a thing together more than in any other of your characters, more than in any other film. I mean, you know, um, in Secrets and Lies... People have secrets. It's part of the title. Yeah. It's part of the way. But somebody in that film knows. So, you know, somebody knows that their partner is cannot have a baby. Somebody knows that somebody else had a baby. Somebody, somebody else knows something. The only person in Vera Drake who knows anything about Vera Drake's 
sideline is Lily and the people who she uh, works, the people who she performs her practice on. I mean, apart from that, and that's a big dramaturgical thing. I wondered, I wonder whether one of the reasons that it was so resonant as a film is because it has a, a, a more conventional. Uh, I don't mean you are more conventional, but the story arc is more. I don't know about that. I really yeah, don't. I mean, you know, it's in the nature of the, of what it's about is that this it, it was illegal, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It follows from that. So I, 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 don't, yeah, I everything. have no no nothing to say about that really. No, and I, I suppose the the confrontation when it comes the the, the yeah. fruit of that long improvisation is a big dramatic moment in a in a way that uh, I don't know what I'm reaching towards it's something to do with a kind of uh, it's more like Ibsen it's something that, that's out of big uh, melodramatic things in a way that uh, really doesn't happen a lot in your uh, films would you accept that? Or do you think I'm talking rubbish? You're allowed to I say that. I don't think that. you're talking rubbish, but I don't have anything to say about it. Okay. <laughs> well, perhaps somebody else will know. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the actors. Um, how, how did you... You knew Imelda's work, presumably, and because you work in a completely different way to anybody else you would have worked with before, did you have to talk about that? <laughs> Well, no, I mean she's she's a brilliant actress. I'd, I'd um, we'd mooted the possibility previously. I'd seen her in lots of things, and she's incredibly versatile. I kn I knew her a bit, and uh, it seemed very natural. And uh, yeah, I suppose what I'm reaching for is that you can't necessarily know that just because somebody is a brilliant actor and. No, but we do work and explore it and things. I mean, I, I, I knew she'd be great, and she was. And I, I can't really say any more than that about it. I suppose David Bradley in Another Year, which we'll discuss later, is another, you know, a, a fabulous actor, somebody whose reputation absolutely Yes, I mean, absolutely uh, the bottom line him. is that, of course, inevitably, I mean, you referred to, um, in the previous discussion this afternoon to the f bogus assumption of something where they always work with the same people. Well, of course, I don't. Um, and you know there are there are really great actors out there who I'd like to work with. I mean there are people that um, I haven't worked with. I'd like to, and every time uh, it crops up, they're tied up doing something else. You know, I mean it's one of those basically. And uh, anyway, Imelda just seemed the uh, the natural. You know. The um, the reason this film is in this kind of family group is obvious. The, the family is sorely tested after the, the revelation, but its closeness is undeniable up until that point. Um, and indeed, that closeness uh, earns its keep. I mean, they, they, they sort of somehow, they're broken, but they get, that you feel that they're going to come through. Go here. You do that very much with uh, Danny May's character it's it's this it's the slightly um again Joyce who is the fear sister-in-law is one of is one of those um upwardly mobile characters that you know you can go back to Beverly or, or uh, even in I forget the character's name in um in high hopes but she's very tightly integrated here in a way because it's a very tight family you've learned the distance between high hopes and here in terms of integrating these people uh, i think I, I i would reflect about that character and the characterization is that especially if you think about the character the sister in uh, high hopes there is a hope, I'm right, as far as I'm concerned, anyhow, there's no um, element of caricature 
in, I mean, she, that's just, is, she is the way she is. Whereas there is, as we've talked about, there is an element of caricature in the characters in High, High Hopes. And indeed, in Beverly and Abigail's Party, which is a very much over-the-top um, study. Um, and actually, for what it's worth, I mean, having this film is set in 1950. Well, I was seven in 1950, so I've got a very clear memory of that of the world of 1950. And that character is very evocative of various adult women, not least some relations that I remember very clearly, you know, uh, in that upwardly mobile mode. Um, and I think it's important because she's a function of... She, they, the two of them and their world, their, their home, their javelin and their, you know, a house and the, her aspiration to get a telly and all the rest of it, um, are uh, an important evocation of the period, you know. Yeah. That's important. But um, to me, they also represent... Uh, a movement in your uh, creative imagination that you're able to integrate the social satire yes. of somebody like that more successfully. Yes. Increasingly after Naked, I don't know why, I doubt whether it was self-conscious, but your experience of just dealing with these issues, yes. you're able to integrate them better. It may be... Uh, it's hard to talk about these kind of things because they're personal, but... Uh, it may be to do with just getting older, really, which is code for more mature. Less angry, do you think? I don't know about that. Um, no, I mean, I always think that um, I always I'm aware of one fact, mm -hmm. and that is that th th there's one moment in my the development of my outlook and the way it manifests itself in my work. Uh, which saw a certain kind of shift. And that was the moment I became a parent. Mm. And that may have something to do with it at some level, but I can't really say any more about it than that. Yeah. I mean, a, a, another sign of this, from my point of view, is the integration of, of Ruth's character, Ruth Sheen's character, Lily, into because she's another, um, you know, I, I mean, she could be a type, and maybe she is a type. We were talking about this earlier, but she's very successfully integrated into the yeah, sure. world in just in terms of writing you were talking earlier about people like yes i mean that mo there's a moment when the daughter shows up and she sort of sits, she looks at her like you know with her fag and the specs and that evokes for me it <laughs> reminds me of my childhood and adults saying oh here he is clever dick <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean the the, the world I mean the dance hall world, where where sure. is is very evocative, and that was obviously yeah. You want you needed to show that. Yeah, well, it's a, we're also you know we want to we want to, I wanted to create a, a a canvas of that world. You know, it's important. In in which Vera is operating. <laughs> yeah, in which and, she lives. Yeah. Yeah, and um, yes, operating has got a, a difficult thing there, but also um, the the the. What seems like a subplot but isn't is is absolutely integral. Is Sally Hawkins' uh, character and you know, what her journey in terms yeah, of the class? I mean, there is no doubt that it's straightforward. I mean, the, once I discovered th these things in the research, mm -hmm. it was very important to have it. You know, um, rich girls c could go and have it done properly in a respectable clinic and etc. and um, and I think the the scene where this older, experienced woman gives her advice, um, again as an evocation of that of, the, of that world, is t terribly important. Really, yeah, I think it, to me those scenes they are one of the things that gives the film a particular punch. I mean, I, I suppose when I watched it again, how important the the class context. Yeah. And also the, the the doctors and, and you know, Cordune, Alan Cordoon is a psychiatrist and things. But I think it's in, you know, I, I, and the whole, well, anyway, it's obvious. That yeah, that, that, but again, as a writer, you integrate it rather brilliantly by having Vera be the cleaning 
lady of sure. Sally's oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. character. I mean, that's very mature writing. Um, okay. The look of the film is important. Ah. Um, because for anyone that's interested in these things, I mean, we actually shot the film n not on um, 35 millimeter stock, but on what was called Super 16. Um, because we felt Dick Pope, the cinematographer, felt, and of course I completely was with him, that, that, that it would help to give it a period look because um, of the grain of the thing. Um, of course, had we shot the film more recently, like Mr. Turner or Peter Lou, which we'll come to, uh, we would have been obliged pretty much to shoot them digitally. And I dare say we could have arrived at a look that would not have been dissimilar. But still, it's interesting, I think, for anyone that's interested in those aspects of things, that uh, that, that was important. And it's also... Every location is a real place. No, absolutely not. Um, uh, I mean, one of the problems of making a period film uh, 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 on, a, on a low budget uh, uh, and in this mode, I mean, you know, in the properly budgeted version of this film, you would have seen Vera Drake walking al al along... Um, Islington High Street with trolley buses and period taxis and all the rest of it. Well, I mean, that was out of the question. And in fact, um, we, we actually bought a 1937 Austin, which had virtually no engine, which the guys used in the rehearsals just to tinker about with. And there are three times in the film where you see this same car. One, when, when she shows up, uh, to do the first abortion, it goes past in the background. What you don't know is that it's got no engine. It's pushed. It pushed past, and it, it it just sort of goes. It just you just see it through between these two walls, you know. Um, no, a lot of quite a lot of the locations were built as sets in the hospital, and we use the hospital itself for, for as a studio. Yeah, it was the most in a way, although. I, the only time I've ever filmed in an actual studio, and you know because you were there, was the Japanese village in Topsy Turvy, which was actually at Three Mills. And otherwise, I've never shot in a studio at all. But this film was shot in a studio mode um, with a, a lot of stuff built, built or using aspects of, you know. Um, the, the, um, the, the, the police station and the cells were a disused, probably, I'm sure, now demolished uh, police station with a magistrate and magistrate's court all in one building, all, all at that time disused. And it was, in fact, where the Crays were, the Cray brothers were always banged up uh, and get or up before the, the beak. Um, it, it was a pretty nasty place with a really nasty um, vibe. Um, so that was for real. And one or two other places, but quite a lot of it was a con construct. Oh, that's interesting. Is that a, that's a particular facet of period films, I suppose, because I remember on Topsy yeah. Turvy, you, yeah, you, a you lot had of it was built. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Quite similar. Very yeah. much so. Um, let me open it up for discussion, aha, people spring into action. Um, do, does anybody have any question or points to make about the rather wonderful Vera Drake? There's somebody on the front row already, I can see, that's right. Hi, um, it was the first time watching the film the other night, I thought it was brilliant, enjoyed it very much. Near your mouth. Oh, my apologies. Um, uh, what You know, the film is, there's some very heavy stuff in there. There's also some very light, light of tone stuff. But as the film goes on, it gets very heavy in that final third or whatever it is. I sort of wonder really how, how did you arrive at ending it at the place you ended it when, you know, you could have sort of skipped forward a few years and have her getting out or you might have stopped earlier. But it ends with this kind of interesting tone when she's with those ladies in the prison. I, I, I think, to be frank uh, about that question, the, the, um, to answer that question, uh, I think it ends how it needs to end. I mean... Um, Jumping forwards a few years, I mean, 
you see, I think it's important, apart from anything else, to hand it over to you, the audience. Now, what happens to her is plainly inevitable and a function of society. Um, in that last penultim penultimate scene in the prison, you get from what the other two inmates say to her, is if she behaves herself, she'll, they'll, she'll get a reduced sentence. So she'll be out in a year or two, whatever it is. And then you're with the family. And it's up to you, really, from then on in to anticipate or to think about how they will deal with it. Um, to have stopped it earlier would, would never have occurred to me because I think, you know, this is about a woman who does what she does and falls foul of them. They catch up with her and she goes through the horrible process of the system and she goes to jail. And so you needed to see her do all of that. And the jail, by the way, it was a real jail in Oxford, which is now a posh hotel, just in my person. Um, apparently the rooms are cells, or the cells are rooms. Or uh, I'm not going to stay there, I've decided. <laughs> um, but uh, so I, that's all I can say, really. I, I, I think, t you know, I mean, I, I've probably made films where we could have had a debate about, well, something else could have happened or... Um, you know, uh, 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 there are alternative scenarios or we could have ended it. But I think this one is inevitable. I think it follows the grain of what needs to happen of what would happen and what did ha does happen. And, and I don't think there's... I think it's kind of non-negotiable, really. I mean, what would it be like if um, the, she was sent down to go to prison and then it ended? I mean, yeah, you need to see what exactly. that's about, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. You have to go, go all over the... You know. Any other thoughts, please? Oh, yes. Well, the mic is with you. I figured it was the easiest way. Um, so I've seen this film a fair few times before. Jack can attest, even watching it again a few weeks ago, I had a good old cry while we watched it. You're just a soppy old chap. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> um, and the thing that I sort of wonder about it is that this is touching on something that you were saying earlier. Um you know, this performance from Imelda Staunton is about as good a performance as I've ever seen from anyone in a film. I think it's completely extraordinary. And you said um, that you invited Imelda Staunton to play the role. You didn't say she auditioned. You said you invited her and you had discussions with her and you knew she could do it. But presumably there are extraordinary actors out there who wouldn't be able to work in the way that you like to work. Was there ever the possibility that you felt you would do this for a few weeks and have to say, this isn't working? Or, or you just felt she was such a good actress, she would be able to function in this way that you needed her to? Well, I did make that assumption, and it turns out I, it worked. Right. I mean, I would have been very surprised, frankly. It would be very surprising if it, it didn't work out. Yet. You know, you, it really would. I mean, I have on perhaps three or four occasions, including in this film, actually, worked with actors in minor roles who, for whom it turned out they couldn't really hack it. There was somebody in this film that... But it really would have been beyond extraordinary if that had been the case with um, uh, Imelda Staunton or the likes of Imelda Staunton, really. I, 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 I think it's a pretty academic question, to be honest with you. I suppose it just raises... I, I mean, for what it's worth, I was interested in that. It ra it, it it raises the, the the question of. I suppose it's instinctive on one level, but because you do not work, we've discussed this. We've discussed it in the context of why Daniel Day Lewis has to stay in character all the way, through because the the, the actor's process needs protecting from the buffeting of the industrial filmmaking process but you don't do that most actors will be trained or have experience of working in the conventionally process so 
there's a sense in which it's a risk for somebody. Look, look, here's the, look, here's the thing in relation to what you're to saying, this. indeed, your question. It's all a risk. <laughs> it's, it's embarking on a journey, a dangerous journey. And I always say this to, to everybody before we start, and not just for the actors, but for everybody. I mean, a filmmaking is, and indeed creating art is, whether you write or um, paint or whatever, and filmmaking is no exception, as indeed is putting on shows. Um, and this kind of film, with the, all the various things that we've been talking about, is as big a collection of risks as, as any. I've actually done projects twice, which collapsed for various reasons, always for outside reasons, but they did. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, it's all a journey of risk. Um, and, I mean, I, 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 I'm disposed to avoid saying anything which winds up just being smug but the bottom line is apart from anything else with a project like this it's gathering together a gang of people on both sides of the camera who trust each other who have got a sense of humor about life and a sense of commitment and seriousness and where we can embark on a journey and make mistakes and experiment and do all that. And there are no egos getting in the way. And on top of that, we're not screwed up, or to put it more technically, fucked up by, you know, Netflix or whoever it might be who are going to interfere with everything and, you know, have to approve and generally dilute the whole thing so that you don't know what the hell you're doing. I mean, it's made with trust and security but it's still dangerous and this film was no exception you know i mean i've described the famous long improvisation that engendered the material of this, that section of the film well it did last for 11 hours and the the strict instruction to the actors for these things is you cannot come out of character you have to stay in character unless there's an emergency unless something catches fire or someone has a heart attack or something and at the end of 11 hours, when finally the word went out, come out of character, those actors sat around just being given cups of tea by the, the support group, just coming down from the experience for, for quite a stretch of time, you know. And then we convened over the next few days, myself individually with each of them, decoding it and processing it and so on and so forth. Um, and that's serious shit, you know. I mean, it's not it's not play acting in the in the in the most superficial sense. So I mean, but having said that, you talk to any of the guys that were involved in that, and they will tell you it's the best thing that ever happened to them, because it was a gas basically, and it is a gas. And uh, you know, um, you, you know. So it, it, yeah, that's all I would say about that. But it is dangerous by its nature. Yeah, and the satisfaction is commensurate yeah, with the, is commensurate with the endeavour. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. There's a question at the back. Here's your mic. Oh, Hi, um, it's just because you mentioned risk, and I thought that's quite interesting. Um, in terms of, and you managed, you said trust, but how are there any rituals or anything that you do that help you manage running so many kind of relationships and things going on and decisions because I mean that has an, an emotional impact on us doesn't it so what um what things do you do if there is anything that help you it helps that yeah because it's so there are so many things right so there's a, it's a very good question and there are a bunch there's a bunch of things that happen first of all <clears throat> um Are you an actor or have you got experience of... Um, both act, like I sometimes act, sing, and I'm a voice coach, really. Oh, yeah, but you're, you're around those sort of things. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, part of the problem, a perennial problem for, for, for actors in all kinds of situations is the assumption that the ensemble, the, the shared experience, is an instant thing that can happen. And sometimes there are productions of various kinds more likely in the theatre than 
on films, but it does happen on films occasionally, where they start off by playing lots of um, games with balls and that sort of thing on the basis that you this will build an ensemble. It's bullshit. Um, that's the, my whole career, by the way. Well, <laughs> okay, that's I, fine. <laughs> no, but, but I'm, I'm answering your... I mean, your question demands a bit of a, a, a long... A bit of a long answer, and that's what you're going to get. Um, so the thing is that, you know, uh, uh, look at any really good football team, and it's a, the, the teamwork is fantastic because each individual player knows what he or she is about. And then the, they've, the, the, the ensemble, the teamwork, is built because everyone's secure. So when I start work on these pr projects, the first thing that happens is I work individually with each actor for quite a stretch. And I mean individually, privately. I mean the sessions we have are just me and the actor. No, no assistant directors, no stage manager, and certainly, and none of the actors, as I've said, uh, know what they, they each don't know what the others are up to. So we talk into existence a, a, a character, and then we start to work on the character. So it, it what builds is a sense of the actor knowing what he or she is doing, and making mistakes, and not fee, not being. Um, affected or inhibited or through competition or a sense of having to comply with other people are doing any of that. It's, it's, and then gradually, when the time is ripe, I put people together and we start to build relationships and so on and so forth. It's an elaborate thing and I can't go into all the details of how we do that. So the first answer to your question is that that the act the, the first ritual in terms of the question you asked is the actor finding finding his or her solid basis then there are strict rules in place about the actors do not they are, you, you must not discuss with each other anything that the other actor wouldn't know about your character in other words it's pri it's private so that that preserves the integrity of the reality in the actual situations that is that's if you like another kind of a ritual um it is the convention with a great deal of work that goes on in the making of films and the putting on of plays where actors the whole work is done with everybody there people watching what other people are doing people suggesting things that other people might do and all, all of that you know uh, uh, um, you know rehearsals of plays where everybody sits you know and the pressure on the moment on the integrity of what's going on is completely counterproductive so that never happens on my things at all including by the way when I've done stage plays where you know it unless you know, people don't watch each other's work, you know, they're only what they're involved in. Um, that is a ritual, if you like, in terms of the, the language of your question. Um, uh, uh, but because it means that, it, 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 it means you can, everyone can maintain the integrity and the truth of what they're doing for their own c character. Of course, that doesn't mean that the production designer, the costume designer, the makeup designer, the cinematographer, and others, th th they are party to it because they're collaborating with me on the realisation of the whole thing. But even then, there's a very... I mean, I've made films... I mean, I remember one film I made, um, uh, Home Sweet Home at the BBC, where it, you have in that story... Um, an extra, the woman is having an affair with the postman down the road and this, there was a scene with her husband in the bedroom and one of the electricians because we'd already shot the scene in this bedroom and this electrician was pretty well hung drawn and quartered by his comrades because he inadvertently referred to the previous scene that we'd shot uh, because everyone knows that the, the, you know, the rules apply to everybody so that they can preserve the integrity of the truth of the thing. 
I think I'm answering your question, sort of. But there aren't any, in terms of sort of um, Zen sitting on the floor rituals and things, I mean, there aren't many of those. There are other things we do which are more esoteric. I mean, you know, there are ways of exploring relationships through um, hands and things, stuff that, I mean, like, for example, you, you know, um, if we hit in the exploration of a relationship, a point where A and B would have a fuck, what doesn't happen is I don't let them actually have a fuck <laughs> because I think that will be out of order, really. So there are ways we then go into a parallel way of exploring it through the use of hands and stuff, which I can't really describe. And it is a bit esoteric. And in a way, that is... A, I don't like to call it a ritual because it's a practical way of tackling problems. And all these things that I'm talking about are practical in the end. One of the things that I take from that is that these these um, procedures uh, are uh, all predicated on not having a script because you're you're working. The, the, yes, of course. It, it, I think that's. Yes, I mean, in a yeah. way, uh, I mean, the reason why I mean, sometimes I ask, well, why don't you just write a script and things? And the fact is, I. I, I, I I, I, I've written scripts in the past. I could never write a script that would be as good as what we arrive at. And, you know, we arrive, as we know, at what we finally arrive at is very precise and very scripted, but through rehearsal. But that rehearsal, which is to say the stuff that we do in the location on the set, um, uh, 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 um, during the period of the shoot, that is only possible because of the preparatory work that we've done and the disciplines that I've just been uh, outlining that continue through to the, you know. But it's a, uh, the key thing for me is that the ownership of the actor and the role yes. is of a completely different order when you've created the role in the way that you've Absolutely. described. It's, it would be impossible as soon as you have the objective script on the pa page, you can't do any of that. Because no. the script is there. No, I mean, uh, uh, it, it's... I have in the distant past tr tried it. It will sort of use some of these things in a way. But it's, in, it's simply um, a necessary part of a process. Yeah. And that's all there is to it. Yeah. Very good. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, it raises a thousand dollars, but it really answers but actually, it really well. does it answer your question? Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, well, there was one other... Okay, if you ask. Um, yeah. The, the, just yourself, because, um, I mean, that's within the production, but also yourself. How do you... Do you have anything like, you know, everyone's into meditation at the moment. You Have what, sorry? Anything like breathing or do you take five minutes in the morning or do you spend an hour thinking about your situations that you're going to... Like, I don't know, maybe how you start your day or something or what's how you your, process it. What's your it. prep? Is that... What's yeah. The, yeah. Prep and then at the end, how you process it, reflective practice, kind of... Well, uh, it's important to have a shit. <laughs> I... It's important <laughs> to, to eat breakfast. Thank you. Um, and, uh, y you know, <laughs> I think I think what you're seeking... It doesn't happen to me at all. Really. Cool. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, yeah. I, I can't. No. I mean, I don't have any of the things I think you want to hear me say. I don't know. It is. It's, it is from a personal point of view. When you ask me about if I'm an actor or etc. Yeah, yeah. It's from learning how to manage that kind of those emotions with myself. Yeah. I mean, so I, I, yeah. I, it's important that I. I mean, here's the thing. I, in a way. This is a sort of a, an elliptical. Uh, I'm supplying what you want to hear. Elliptic. No, I know. I'm only joking. Um, I've talked about setting up, imp up improvisations that happen in real time. Uh, and the discipline of those is that the actors have not got to try and make anything happen and so on and so forth. And it means that there are long, long, long interminably boring improvisations that go on and on and on and on uh, in which in conventional 
dramatic terms, nothing happens, or it takes, you know, but things are happening and things are growing and so on. Now, I could therefore claim, I could claim in the Guinness Book of Records to have sat through more long, interminably, profoundly boring improvisations than anybody else in the history of theatrical or cinematic enterprise. Um, but in relation to your question, it gives me time to think. It gives me time to ponder and reflect. And that's important. But it's, it's also true, isn't it, that your working day during these, the creation of these films is seven o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock at night. It's, it's well, yes, I mean, it's less so than it used to be. I used to rehearse till, but I, I don't do But uh, no, I mean, I, I, apart from anything else, I mean, rehearsals generally, especially in the theatre, are generally conventionally start at 10 or 10.30. I always start at nine o'clock. Um, which is not always popular, but it's only because you can get more in before lunch. You know, if, I, if I'm d doing uh, two-hour sessions, an actor for two hours, another actor for two, you know, all that stuff, um, there's never enough time, you know, and, y y you know, uh, we're always up against the clock. Partly because of what we're talking about, which is that, that you don't know what you're doing and it, it's got to be explored, you've got to allow things to grow and all of that. And sometimes at the end of a day or two, I think, well, what have we, not, we haven't really got anywhere yet, but it's growing, you know, whatever. And there's the, can I just add to that? There's also the, the pr keeping of prodigious notes, which is... Well, yes, yes, and that's interesting you should say that. I mean, um, it is interesting because I, I do and I don't. Um, when I work with the actors, I mean, the, the first thing I... For any, including these characters in the historical films and things, that I ask the actors to talk about lots of people they actually know, uh, and I make I write notes so that I remember what they've said, and then gradually I whittle it down, and we reject people until we arrive at the source people that are, we then build a characterization, character and characterization based on. Um, so for that, I make notes. But I don't make notes about what, with all the improvisations that are going on in the preparatory period. I simply don't. I just let it go in and I sink in. And I, I do make notes in the later stage when they are, when we're improvising in order to then distill and construct um, Scenes. scenes with concern. and even then I don't always make notes it depends you know sometimes I don't I, I and I have somebody with me who will write down once we fix dialogue we'll write it down so that the, it's there so they can remember it next time we come to work on it and so on so, on. so it, I, I actually um, to tell you the truth in relation to note taking and I don't want to dwell on this it's a, not very interesting it is interesting well uh, 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 it's it's a kind of organic thing and I don't actually a lot of the time when you might expect that it's like people say oh so do you ever do an improvisation again and the answer is no there's no such thing as doing an improvisation again an improvisation is an improvisation you may explore the same situation starting from the same premise but it is another improvisation and that is true of the creative process when you're a composer you you will recognize what that is um uh, 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 and so um that thing of writing it uh, and sometimes i've been asked you know why don't you have a tape recorder there or a, you know record it and i did in 1966 when i first started doing this when i had just begun to do this kind of work i took an, a little um tape recording machine into a rehearsal and after about 20 minutes I threw it out of the window basically because I realised it was c counterproductive. The important thing is that the, the experience is being had and you've got to take from it what you can and what you need to and not try and capture everything as though it was pearls yes. because it not it, it, you know it's the cumulative experience and if you can't recapture it there's a reason why you can't recapture yeah. it yeah you know? and again this is relating to instinct and emotion yeah, and totally. connection to yeah. the material and the, you know i mean I, I i suppose i i, I should say this that a, a part of my 
um, early journey in thinking about doing these things was, was the sp spending time at, at art school. Uh, having trained as an actor, I then went to art school, as you know, and um, just, just uh, learning about just keeping a sketchbook, which I don't do now, but I obviously did at that time, um, th th that the sketchbook is not you know you're not capturing every moment to reproduce it you are it's part of the process of experiencing you know and it's the experiencing that is the important thing that is the answer the 25 minute answer to your question <laughs> thank you <laughs> but very comprehensive that's the question here hi so um bringing it back to vera drake specifically there's well there's just one thing i wanted to ask ruth sheen's character in the film, and every time she drinks tea, she pours it into the saucer, then drinks the saucer. I just want to know what that was all about. Well, it's what a lot of working class people did. <laughs> I remember people doing that, and so did she. Um, I don't know what it's about, or uh, what the advantage, I think maybe it's to do with it being cool, cooling it, but uh, it was a thing. Sure, thanks. Sorry, you've been, been prying my mind for weeks now. I wanted to know. <laughs> As a, so, I mean, of many things, that was the. Yes, thing that I kept that's a back. very, very important question. <laughs> no, thank you. It is actually, it's never really occurred to me, probably because I grew up with it as well. Yeah, yeah. It was just kind of around. But it, it, it's new to me, so. No, no. Seems, I think we've all moved to mugs away from cups. I think that's possibly what it is. But we digress. We, yes. Anyway. Thank you. So, uh, your films are obviously very strong dramatically uh, and, and they, they're getting sort of with time they're getting more and more complex but one thing that I feel is is somewhat underrated or hasn't been discussed and, and you mentioned it earlier is how the cinematography plays into into them it's it's it is very well integrated into that drama in, in a way that I haven't quite seen in, in other films and I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the relationship and how you construct the the images in these films. I know you, you've been working with Dick Pope for essentially ever. So how does that relationship work and how do you create those images? And in particular, just bringing it to Vera Drake, things that have been haunting me for the last, what, two or three weeks have been the uh, the, the reveal of um, there's like a crab left when you see the, the well-off people. So Vera's working and then the, the lady of the house just gets revealed for a, a dolly move. And then there's this very special moment between the, between the two brothers um, when just after, after they come back from the police in which it's like a six minute scene in a two shot and they just, he shares the, the information that has, has come to him. Well, um, obviously, you have to have the relationship between the, the director and the cinematographer has to be, you have to be absolutely on the same page uh, in terms of taste and a sense of what it's all about and the way look of things and the discipline of shots and so on. Um, and uh, although I worked before um, working with Dick Pope, who first shot my first first film of, of mine that he shot was Life is Sweet in 1990, and we've shot everything ever since. I worked with other people before him, um, particularly, not least, the great Roger Pratt, with whom I had a similar um, uh, rapport, uh, and we'll be looking at Meantime, uh, in a few days. So th the sharing of taste and of a sense of what it's about is important, obviously. What we don't do is to start from... We don't make storyboards or have a storyboard artist. Um, in other words, we don't plan everything out theoretically. I work with the actors without the crew there, um, in the location, that is, to create the scene. Um, with, and that includes Dick, the cinematographer not being there. <coughs> and so I can 
work out the scene in the location, using the location, using the action as it grows, pinning it down and making decisions about what happens uh, dramatically, uh, theatrically, physically, technically, etc. Then the crew will join in and we'll run the scene for them and run it for the cinematographer, Dick Boat. And I may say, I think it's this. And he may say, absolutely, I, I can see that, yeah, that works fine. Let's get it lit and do it. Or I may say, I think it's this. And he may say, well, yeah, but, you know, I was looking at it from over there and the lights and for various, in which case we'll look at it and we'll work. And sometimes with the longer sustained scenes, like the scene, for example, when the cops come around in Vera Drake, um, I won't have made any definite decisions and we'll work through the action. The actors stay with us, they'll run bits and we'll work through, you know, and work out how we're going to shoot it. But to answer your question, we never do anything, make the camera do anything that's unmotivated. We never do fancy shots for the sake of fancy shots. We never make, uh, we never f uh, allow ourselves to fall in love with something that's kind of uh, interesting visually, but actually isn't organically related to or a function of what's going on. And once you get into, once you embrace the discipline of shooting in a way that is completely organic and integrated with and motivated by what's going on, it becomes very stimulating and you don't feel that you're missing out on, on other things that you could be doing that, you know. Um, and in a way, that's the answer to your question. It's about um, it being organic. So it sounds like the, the relationship is similar to what you have with the actors. You just extend that, I guess, to yeah, everyone totally. on, on the creative team. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, uh, I have the same relationship with editors, with composers. We've had that relationship on a number of films. Um, with, um, y y y uh, 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 with sound people, you know, it's about, um, you know, working. Uh, it's, it's about not bullying or dictating people but sharing with people and you know working with creative people who have their own talents to 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 make the most of and to contribute and so on. I would just add that what you've said is exactly my experience that you are treated in exactly the same way as the actors are and in a way you're doing you you feel as though you're doing a particular job on the same film it, it's never a you never feel separate from them more questions more questions while I wipe my nose thank you. yeah thank you very much I, ha I am a filmmaker and a, a documentary filmmaker and I use fiction as a way to get the real people who are stigmatized and cannot be seen. I work with migrant sex workers. I'm to, sorry, just hold it there. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I said like, um, I am a filmmaker and, and a documentary filmmaker, but I use improvisation with the real people to write fictional scripts uh, that allow them to play a role close to, to their real lives while protecting their identities. To themselves. Yeah. And I was very struck by the the way in which your films, which I really love, you know, feel like a documentary sometimes. They feel very, very close to, to reality. And in my films, that bond is because of the connection between the real people who write it and what they lived. And I was thinking about in your, with your method, you know, is it something, uh, what is the source of the truthfulness of, of your of your characters is it the preparation that the actors make and then how you work with them is that their embodiment because when I was watching Vera Drake again uh, I was I felt I was part of a women of a women's world which was um, um, you know normally something we wouldn't be able to access you now the first part in which she's helping out these these girls is something like it's a completely gendered world and then it's when men 
come in that you know she's taken to you know to jail and all of that and so i was wondering you know what is the source of the truthfulness and of the realness of your of your you know of the characters in your work because because um they it feels really real but it's you know it's your own creation i'm not sure it's, it's quite a hard question to answer um but as i've apart from anything else as i've said a few minutes ago um so far as the actual characterizations which is how they play their characters, or the characters themselves. All the characters, everybody's playing in this film or in any other of mine. We've used real people that the actors know as a starting point for the character. Now, that isn't to say that it's ever just a portrait of the original person, because quite often, in fact, invariably what we do is we wind up with Having talked about lots of possibilities of real people that the actor knows, we wind up with usually about three, maybe two or three, usually three, and we meld them together. So it's never actually um, a direct portrait. It was more so in some of my earlier films. However, that's part of the answer to your question. Part of the answer to the question is, of course, that, you know, I am concerned by, I suppose, by nature or by commitment to make films about which are about the real world and about real experiences and about real, about real, about all of that, about society. So, so that, that's, I mean, you know, one is the process, the journey of investigation that right through which one arrives at the likes of this film, is a whole myriad, endless series of choices. And when you make choices, you're making choices based on your outlook, on your motivation, on your um, spirit and uh, what you feel it's about and so on. And uh, that's always, in some way, uh, about the sense of the real world and so on. And in a way, that's the sort of answer to your question. Beyond that, I don't know what else I can say about it, except that that is the, in the nature of the m sort of quirky medium that this is. Thank you. But could I ask a supplementary to that, which is there is a, a, this documentary field. It's something to do with the way the locations, the world that you operate in. But there is also this other thing, which is a heightening. Um, I, th I don't know how that happens, that actually uh, it, it's it's kind of, it's not surreal, it's kind of super real. Yes, I think to some degree, <clears throat> I would say that that is uh, um, what I've just talked about in the second part of my answer to the, this gentleman's question, um, which is that it's in the nature, as far as I'm concerned, it's in the nature of how I look at life, basically. Um, I think. Um, and obviously, I suppose, in a way, you're inviting everyone to collaborate on the same, in the same sp spirit. It's hard to put your finger on, really. I suppose uh, what's interesting, what I... Uh, sorry, I just... just I, I, I suppose what I would say uh, to, to what, you, what you're talking about now is that I can't, I, I can't... There is no technical answer to how... to what that heightening is about. It is in the nature of, you know, one's outlook as an artist. I mean, you know, it's not a big deal. If you look at any... I mean, you look at... Think about painters. You, you, you know, I mean... You know, whether you're talking at one end of the spectrum about Hieronymus Bosch or Bruegel or, or whether you're talking about, you know, um, uh, the Impressionists, um, uh, uh, it's about, 
an inevitable way that it comes out. You know. Yes, and I think I suppose what I was driving towards and um, is that you have found a way of making your vision, the way you look at the world, you express it in your films as an independent filmmaker in a way that you watch a gazillion other commercial films that are put out in a rather factory way. And they are, um, they're not, they're, they're McDonald's as opposed to home cooking. It, it, it has that air of a personal stamp yeah i can't of. i can't comment on that without being self-satisfactory well self i think satisfied i mean i think you're allowed to be gl- uh, uh, glib smug and various other things so i'll, I'll do all that for you yeah fine. Fine. i've got nothing else to say about it. um <laughs> anybody else yes there's a, a lady at the back thank you um i was just wondering you mentioned that you are trained as an actor so I'd be quite interested to know um, sort of transitioning, obviously, in your early days in terms of from an actor to obviously a writer and director and also your reasons for that. Well, I, I trained as an actor, but I didn't really want to be an actor and the world is unquestionably a better place for my not having <laughs> become one. But I went to RADA in 1960 and did the um, training there. And apart from anything else, what I can report is that in that uh, institution in 1960, very different from na- how it is now, was very stale and old-fashioned and prescriptive. And, um, uh, you know, we just doing a play was all about learning the moves and learning the lines and not falling over the furniture and not really investigating what the play was about or what the characters were about or the backgrounds or the backstories or anything and so to to some degree I to a considerable degree I kind of from the earliest reacted against that that was food for thought also out there in the in the zeitgeist were things going on you know in the French Nouvelle Vague the stuff that was that was happening in New York you know with and John Cassavetti's films came along and then I discovered world cinema which growing up in Manchester in the 40s and 50s I never I saw movies all the time but I never saw a film that wasn't either a Hollywood or a British film and I discovered world cinema and, and all sorts of other things that led me to uh, in the direction of not only wanting to do what I knew I wanted to do in some form, which was to make things up, which I had done in my teens, even at primary school, I was putting on plays. Um, I I, um, uh, then realised that there was something to explore in the territory of not just sitting in a room writing, but of collaborating. And uh, I mean, my involvement with acting left me fascinated with the possibilities of what actors could do without necessarily wanting to do it myself. Great, thank you very much. Wise choice. <laughs> um, you can, however, see Mike uh, in Two Left Feet, uh, a fine film. Uh, from what year? I refuse to discuss it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 